Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Mayers from WISPolitics.com. Welcome to our virtual event for the week, Earth Day, the next 50 years. I want to thank our sponsors for this event. Uh, part of these, uh, most of these sponsors are with our regular event series at the Madison Club, but of course, we can't be doing that now. So here we are, live to you via Zoom. So I want to thank Hush Blackwell, American Family Insurance, Walmart, XL Energy, ARP Wisconsin, and the Wisconsin Hospital Association. And special sponsors for this particular event, Bolt Construction Company, the Outrider Foundation, and the Wisconsin Environmental Initiative. So this is a two-part program. We're, uh, we're going to do it uh, in an hour. Uh, the first part of the program is with uh, two uh, members of the Governor's Task Force on climate change, including the Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor uh, Mandela Barnes, he chairs the Governor's Task Force on Climate Change, and State Representative Mike Kuglich, Republican of New Berlin, he's the chair of the Assembly Committee on Energy and Utilities. So welcome, Lieutenant Governor, and welcome State Representative Kuglich. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Appreciate it. So, Given all that's going on, let's just start with the lieutenant governor. Given all that's going on uh, with the coronavirus and, and everything else, um, I'm wondering how that, how that uh, informs your view of this 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So, lieutenant governor, uh, how, does, how does all this sit with you? Yeah, I'll say that it informs uh, my view of Earth Day in so many different ways. Uh, especially when you look at, you know, the environmental, the positive, actually, environmental impact of, of, of these orders and you see reduced carbon emissions, fewer miles being traveled. Uh, there is something for us to think about when we're on the other side of, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. But for half a century, Earth Day has brought people together from across the world to demonstrate their support for environmental protection and conservation. Um, yeah, it starts with indigenous communities right here in Wisconsin. Uh, the Gaylord Nelson, who founded Earth Day in 1970, or excuse me, yeah, 1970. That's something that Wisconsin I should be very proud of, and it's a tradition that we should all work very hard to continue. Uh, and you look at youth all across the country and across the world who are standing up uh, for a cleaner future, uh, because that's what this is all about. It's about the next generation and the generation after. And these values are core to our history and core to the future of Wisconsin. But we know this year is going to be a little bit different. Uh, just last week, uh, the governor extended the safer at home order because we see that we are flattening the, flattening the curve. Uh, but in order for us to continue to flatten the curve, to get to a place where we can feel comfortable again, uh, means that we have to continue down this path. Uh, because if we were to let up now, all the hard work and sacrifices that so many people have made already will be in vain if we try to reopen things too quickly. Uh, we know that COVID-19 continues to disrupt our daily lives, and a lot of people are feeling unsure and overwhelmed. And you look at Milwaukee, uh, we're facing some of the worst impacts of this pandemic, and we got to recognize the disproportionate impacts that this happened on uh, people of color. And the Governor Evers called it a crisis within a crisis, which it exactly, which uh, which um, you know describes it exactly uh, how it is. In every part of the state, the fear and anxiety is real. And, you know, people are dealing with some really hardship or some, some extreme hardships. And we have to be very conscious of that. We have to be sympathetic to that, which we are. And we are fortunate though, that amid so much uncertainty uh, that our earth does continue to provide us with daily solace in the form of fresh air that we can breathe and sunlight that you know, brightens our homes. And uh, there aren't a whole lot of people walking by anymore, but even uh, you see the, the, the plants and the, the greenery around the, the capital that's starting to bud. And the beautiful natural spaces in our state can serve as, uh, as a little bit of respite for us to ease our mind and provide us with the land and to be able to physically and mentally care for our bodies. But we have to be very diligent in protecting these spaces uh, because the next 50 years of Earth Day are not promised as this uh, pandemic has showed, as it has highlighted, if we continue to disregard our environment, if we ignore the science and reality of climate change, if we continue the terrible trend of pollution of our water and air, uh, we may not even have another 50 years before these natural uh, resources 
uh, before they cease to exist. Uh, so while the way we look at things is different, the way we act upon these things are different, but I think that the pandemic has showed that our environment is important, our earth is important, we only get one, and that is the main way that people have been able to uh, enjoy themselves and, and have some sort of normalcy and, and, and break uh, you know, the mold of having to just stick around the house all the time and uh, you know, driving themselves crazy. Uh, but we have to take better care of what we've been given. Okay. Representative Kuglitz, what the, what is all this? How does all this that's going on with the coronavirus and everything else? How does it how's that shaping your personal view of this 50th anniversary and what the future holds? Well, I first off want to thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, this panel with the Lieutenant Governor. We served together in the assembly and and just want to say uh, hello to Mandela and uh, but when you look at what we're going to talk about today and, and energy and, and how utilities interact, because that's where I come from, from the, uh, the energy chair and what the future is. I think we have to take a little step back and look at what we've accomplished so far. Um, as the energy chair over the last seven years, um, I noticed a big change and probably the biggest change um, is the growth in renewable energy and uh, more specifically solar and wind. Um, I think since the economics and the efficiency of uh, solar and wind has increased, so has the popularity. Um, and you look at the cost, if you look at solar, over the last eight years, the cost of solar has decreased by 80%. Um, so renewables are becoming more popular with the utilities. And, and I think again, because it's economics and also the utilities are committed to reducing um, CO2 emissions. So when you look at that, and then you, you couple it with what the MISO Q and you look at what the PSC has approved so far in solar and wind in the next, that's gonna be built in the next couple of years. There's over 6,100 new megawatts of solar being proposed. Um, and over 1,200 new megawatts of wind being proposed in the state of Wisconsin. And some may say, what do those numbers mean? But when you look at currently, in the state of Wisconsin, if you combine solar and wind, it's about 860 megawatts. So if you look at, in the next couple of years, there's going to be almost 10 times the amount of solar and wind in the state of Wisconsin than there is today. So when you couple that with what we're celebrating tomorrow, as far as the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, I would think the people that support Earth Day and, and support environmentalism would look at that as a, as a positive trend in Wisconsin. And I think when you look at Wisconsin's own Senator Gaylord Nelson, who basically was a driving force of creating this special day for the environment, I think he would be proud. I think um, when you look at what he did in the support, the big public support of, of Earth Day, that that earned basically environmentalism um, a last place in national politics. So I think if you look at the trend of Wisconsin from where it's come, where we're going, and I think the other side is that when you look at the pandemic, today we're doing this virtually, right? Because we can't be together. And I just read an article in today's paper in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel about all the plans to celebrate the um, 50th anniversary that was supposed to have millions of people across the, the world outside, celebrating in parks and stadiums and universities, planting trees. And now because of pandemic, unfortunately that they're gonna be another casualty to um, the social distancing and things. So at one end, kind of, I think we're going in the right direction. I'm sure there's people that think we should go further. Um, but I think when you look at where we've been with the pandemic, I think we're moving in the right direction. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the task force, uh, Lieutenant Governor, that you're chairing uh, for Governor Evers. Give us a little status report on where things stand with the, the task force and where you hope to take it. Yeah, so we were lucky to get our uh, second in-person meeting. We were lucky to have that right on the cusp of uh, 
of a safer home order. It's when things were getting a little bit uh, dicey. There were cautions made. We we were actually social distancing at that time. People weren't touching microphones, uh, but we didn't. I don't think at that point we realized, uh, you know, what what the world would look like the week the following week. Uh, organiz or excuse not organizations, but our subcommittees have been continuing to meet virtually. Uh, to sort of, you know, gather ideas and discuss more in depth about what do they want to come out of the uh, tech or out of the uh, task force. The recommendations were set to be due in August. Uh, we are likely to be you know, communicating with the governor's office to push that back just a little bit, uh, just given the fact that things have changed so much. Uh, but the mission is still, uh, you know, very close to us, very dear to us. We still look to do the work that's necessary to make Wisconsin a leader in climate. And, you know, uh, Representative Coolidge talked about where we where we are. And, you know, I am I'm thankful that we're making strides. And I just want us to continue that direction to double down and do even more to do the most that we can. Uh, I think that uh, this is a moment, as I've said many times before, for Wisconsin to really flex its muscle and, and not just lead the region, but uh, lead the nation uh, when it comes to use of renewable energy, when it comes to production of renewable energy, and being the example that we've always been when it comes to uh, environmental stewardship and climate responsibility. Uh, I think that's very responsible, or I think that's very possible for us to do. And I think that each task force member understands that challenge, but there's also uh, the challenge uh, to, to, to overcome uh, a lot of the gridlock we're seeing, and, and the climate is an issue, uh, you know, as you know, Representative Kula just talked about, it, there's an example that this can be a bipartisan issue, a nonpartisan issue, uh, actually. Uh, you look at, you know, the 50th anniversary celebration of, uh, of, an, of Earth Day, and, you know, Governor, former Governor Tommy Thompson is, is one of the, the leaders for uh, for University of Wisconsin for their celebration. And I think that we need more people to continue to step up. Uh, I don't think that this is a thing where we can say, well, we've gotten this far, we can stop now. Uh, much like flattening the curve, we see that uh, we're doing the right thing. We're meeting the projections when it comes to COVID-19. That is because of the safer home measures that we put in place. That is because people are uh, practicing safe social distancing and, and being responsible. And so we have it. Uh, hit the, the total number of possible cases we could have, the total number of possible deaths we could have. And the same thing when it comes to uh, making sure that we are leading with the, on, on issues of the environment. We can't just get comfortable and say that we have uh, so many uh, megawatts, so many kilowatts of renewable energy that are uh, that is going toward powering uh, people's homes and every other facet of their daily lives. We should look towards the future and, and think about how we can continue on this trend and we will be uh, in a position that uh, is envious of, uh, that is the, the envy of other states in this country. Okay, Representative Kuglich, uh, where, where do you want the, uh, the panel, to, uh, the task force to go here in the next few months, uh, knowing that the August 31 uh, deadline is, is, uh, will probably be extended? What are, what are some of your priorities for the task force? Well, you know, I think when I looked up Executive Order 52, um, the Governor Evers, the task force, and the task force charge um, is advise and assist the governor in developing a, a strategy to mitigate and adapt to the effects of climate change. So, I mean, that's, that's rather broad. Um, so, I, I think, I think in order for us to come up with good sound recommendations, I think we need to, as, as the uh, Lieutenant Governor said, extend the time for recommendations. Because of the pandemic, we just, uh, we just have not had a, a chance to continue our, our exchange of, of ideas and knowledge. I mean, that's the key is we need to exchange more knowledge back and forth with the uh, task force members and also have the uh, the public hearings so that we can be heard. Um, I, I think for us to come to some type of consensus, um, we're going to need to extend this. And, and I think it shouldn't be a race um, to get it done. It should be pragmatic. Um, we should get agreement because at the end of the day, it's not how many recommendations that you list. It's how many recommendations that we can actually come together and agree on um, 
to move forward. Do you like the spirit of that, uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes? Yeah, no, I absolutely do. Um, I, I do think that we should be very thoughtful on this. We can't we can't rush this at all. Uh, on the, on one hand, on the other hand, I do think that you know we should take the immediate steps that we can. But being thoughtful is the best way uh, to to do this as we need to do it. And people's lives have been offended. People have added responsibilities now who are on the task. Even though people may not be going to work every day as they as they did. I mean, there are other responsibilities, especially folks with children, uh, as people just try to figure out how to navigate this appropriately. Uh, it could be a little burdensome and we would be asking a whole lot from a, from a lot of folks if we were to try to uh, try to rush this at this moment. Yeah, um, I also want to stick with you, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, on this one and then go back to Representative Coolidge. Representative mentioned the rise of renewables, uh, and a lot of that has had to do with economics, right? It, renewables became a lot cheaper, and so I think there was, that made it easier for utilities uh, and others to move in that direction. And so uh, uh, I guess I'm wondering how much of this is just at the mercy of market forces, right? Or, or uh, you know, how much can a task force um, do when, when the markets are so dominant in some respects in the energy arena? Yeah, we can't discount the uh, influence of, of market forces, uh, but a lot of it has to be, uh, you know, what the market can't handle, uh, a lot of it has to be, there's political will, and there is also the moral imperative for us to do the right thing. Uh, just looking, like I said, looking at the future, what kind of planet do we want to leave for the next generation? And how are we following, uh, you know, the legacy that has been set forth uh, for generations and, and in some instances millennia before we even got here? Uh, we need to, one, accept the science. I think that that should be the overarching thing is that we accept the science and leave the science. Um, I think eventually uh, the market will follow in other ways, especially you see businesses uh, across country, across the world who are, you know, rushing to tout their environmentalism, who are rushing to show everyone how responsible they are uh, with the planet, how sustainable they are as a company, because folks, uh, you know, my age and, and, and younger, people want to spend their money responsibly. They want to spend their money at companies who are doing the right thing. They want to spend their money uh, with businesses and organizations uh, who actually care about their future. So there, there's the market aspect on two different ends. There's the cost renewable, and then there's also uh, the sheer marketing aspect of it. And above all of that, we just, we have to do the right thing. There's the moral imperative for us to act as leaders, as lawmakers, uh, as, as people who are crafting policy. And I think, you know, that shouldn't be lost. You know, it's, it's about what are we gonna do uh, for people who are not ourselves? What are we, what are we gonna do uh, for the next generation? But there's the other part, I guess I forgot to mention, is the job creation aspect of it. You know, across the country, uh, that's where job growth uh, had been happening. It's been outpacing the rest of the economy, jobs and renewable energy. And it's important for Wisconsin uh, to get a piece of that action. Hmm. Okay, so Representative Kuglich, in terms of the market, we're in the middle of an oil glut now. Uh, and uh, um, as I said before, what you talked about the rise of renewables had a lot to do with the, uh, the price of, of renewables becoming uh, easier for utilities to move to. How do you view the market forces as affecting uh, what the, the task force may do? So if you're talking about oil, um, you know, that's where I have to, to be up front and say I'm not a futures uh, oil market expert or, or talking that. But I, I think when you look at um, a glut of oil is basic supply and demand, right? So you've got the, the Russians and OPEC that have been battling in a, a production overproducing. Uh, you look at the economy worldwide and with businesses and, and schools and factories being closed, obviously there's uh, less demand for, for oil. So I think when you look at the glut and the price, that is it's basic market forces, supply and demand, how that affects um, the future. I think it's temporary. Um, but it will, I think, put a, uh, put a chill on, on the economics. Uh, I mean, especially when you look at, um, uh, EVs, right. Electric vehicles, um, 
when you can get gas for under a dollar a gallon, is anybody going to be looking at an electric vehicle? There can be some that will make that personal choice based on social issues. Um, but if you look at when is there the biggest bump in sales for electric vehicles or hybrids, it's when gas is hovering around four dollars a gallon. So when gas is at a dollar a gallon, I think uh, people's personal uh, choices, you know, as far as electric vehicles, um, is going to be a lot less. So as fossil fuels or the glutton oil is low, I think that that will have somewhat of a, uh, of a chill on uh, on probably the movement going forward. Okay, I want to go get to some uh, questions from attendees. They were submitted them in advance. I may not, some, I may sometimes just read them or I may uh, paraphrase them since uh, um, some of the questions mesh together. But along these lines, let's just start with Representative uh, Kuglis here. Is putting a price on carbon an important component of addressing climate change? What do you think of uh, the carbon tax idea? I've never been a fan of, of carbon tax. Um, I, I'm not a fan of any artificial market forces uh, put on by, by government. I think the resurgence that we talked about uh, earlier with the, especially the renewables is because it be, has become economical. It's become a, a good uh, decision. Well, you know, when you look at, at energy and, and you look at, there's always been kind of a mantra in the, in the utility energy field uh, whatever you produce has to be safe, reliable, and affordable. And once you start adding carbon tax to everything, you start artificially pricing it out of the market. So my, my recommendation is, is let, let the free market work. It's shown that renewable solar and wind are are progressing and, and growing because of those market forces. So I, I wouldn't be a, a, a promoter of, of carbon tax. Okay, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, uh, do you have any opinion there on the carbon tax idea? Yeah, so in this whole you know equation, there are just a lot of pieces. And I think that carbon tax, I wouldn't necessarily write it off. I, I think that we should explore all options, but probably more important than a carbon tax would be carbon sequestration. I think that provides so many more opportunities, especially for our uh, rural community to get involved and uh, participate in the uh, clean energy economy. Okay, let me uh, stick with you, Lieutenant Governor, uh, on this. I'm gonna paraphrase a couple of audience questions. A lot of this is how can, uh, a couple question questioners wanna know how can the state help local governments or help local communities uh, move more toward renewables, uh, move more toward the adoption of renewables, move more toward local solutions? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we can do now is uh, get away. I think that uh, for quite a while, one of the bigger problems or bigger challenges uh, was erosion of local control. And as long as, you know, cities, counties, towns, and villages are able to make their own decisions, uh, because that's where the movement has been happening for a long time. You know, a lot of these cities across uh, Wisconsin have already made commitments uh, long before the state made their commitments. So they've been leading the way. Uh, and it's important for us to be able to provide resources as needed for them uh, to be successful in their programs. And I think there's also a chance for us to, you know, just overhaul the way that we do things when it comes to uh, new building construction, when it comes to capital projects, I think that there should be uh, a component uh, tied to it, uh, a renewable energy component that are tied to those new uh, construction projects. Um, for some of our older buildings across the state that are you know, beautiful buildings, whether courthouses, libraries, schools, uh, some of that classic architecture, I mean, buildings that we would never tear down in a million years. Uh, however, a lot of them aren't the most uh, sustainable, they're not the most uh, efficient. And I think that there should be uh, programs that offer grants for uh, those cities, towns, and villages to you know, retrofit those buildings, to make them more efficient uh, as they are, to make them as efficient as they are visually appealing. And I think that's a big part of the equation. I mean, how much energy usage 
comes from our public buildings, our public spaces. And I think uh, that is a, uh, an area where people can get uh, involved easily and make the necessary upgrades and provide job opportunities for folks and also reduce their carbon footprint. Yeah, Representative Kuglish, part of this question or, or uh, another theme of the question is uh, about funding for local governments to speed up maybe adoption of some of these renewables. And somebody specifically talks about the state of Illinois uh, block grant program to, to uh, uh, have 100% uh, renewable energy by 2050. I'm not familiar with that Illinois program, but that's what the questioner asked. But what, what about the idea of helping locals through more funding? Representative Kuglish. Oh, um, I mean, I, I think if the local, if the locals want to spend the funds they get from the state in energy efficiency, I think they should do that. I think they there's access to focus on energy programs um, in place already to add an additional funding source. Um, for the locals, you know, I'd have to really give that some consideration. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I mean, there's not a specific proposal. It's just the idea of how do you how do you help the locals? And and before we end this first segment, are we in a? Is this really a realistic goal? Carbon free, um, carbon free electricity by 2050. I'll just start with you, uh, Representative Kuglish, and then uh, go to the Lieutenant Governor. So it's interesting because even when you when you talk to the utilities, um, they have plans of reducing carbon by 80% by 2050. They presented at, our, at University of Stevens Point at the task force. Um, there was one of the uh, XL Energy said that they believe that they can get to 100% carbon free. But there was a caveat or an asterisk, and that is if technology is, is present. So currently, there is just not the technology to get to zero carbon. Now, people believe it's coming, but as of today, that's just not reality. Uh, it comes back to, you know, it's not always, it's not always sunny and it's not always windy. So, you know, we need baseload. What's 24 um, seven? So how are we going to get there? And, and a lot of people talk about battery storage and, and um, a lot of people think it's coming. And, and if you even talk to the, the experts, they'll admit that it's not here now, but they do believe that it will be not, you know, coming in the future. Okay, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, is that a realistic goal, carbon free electricity by 2050? Oh, yeah, I absolutely think it's realistic. Is it going to be a challenge? Of course. Is it going to be easy? No. Uh, but I think that we have everything at our disposal that we need to make it happen. I think, you know, right down, I'm in the Capitol right now, right down the street, we have the University of Wisconsin-Madison, one of the leading research institutions. And I think there are so many folks uh, right there on that campus who are more than ready uh, to be the drivers to make sure that we get to that goal. We just have to bring uh, people on board. We have the expertise uh, right at our right right at our disposal. Folks who've been doing this work uh, for a long time, but hadn't necessarily had the outlet to make it happen. And you know, to Representative Kuglich's point, uh, it's not always sunny. It's not uh, always windy. Uh, but if you look, you know, just to the southwest, states like Iowa that have uh, you know more opportunity for wind energy because just where they're located uh, geographically. And we've already begun, uh, you know, building power lines that would get some of that energy, uh, some of that wind energy from other states, Minnesota and Iowa. And we have to, you know, look at all possible options. But it's more than it, it is more than a plausible scenario for us to get to 100 uh, percent carbon free by 2050. I think we can actually beat that goal. Um, and, you know, other parts of the country, other parts of the world, they are. They're looking at 2050 as a date that's too far out uh, into the future and, you know, looking at 2035. And I, I think that we shouldn't just be aspirational. We should truly uh, look at the opportunities that we have and the, and the folks, uh, the brain power, uh, the technology, because technology moves fast. The technology may not be here today, uh, but the technology uh, that exists today is going to be much different 
in five years. You look at uh, some of the solar panels and their capacity five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, there's much more capacity uh, that they have now. I was um, in Green Bay last year, I got to install a solar panel and it was just remarkable just looking at the, their first, their first uh, array installation uh, versus the new one and the capacity of the new versus the old. And you know, technology as it advances, I think that is what's going to give us the opportunity. I don't think we should look at the technology being not being present now as a hindrance. I think that we should also look at that as an opportunity for us to get to our to our goal. And there are more than enough people here uh, with the brain power to in this state uh, that are ready and willing to get us there. Okay, well, that ends the first part of our program. I want to thank the Lieutenant Governor, who has uh, another appointment. But thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Keep us informed on what's going on with the Task Force on Climate Change. And uh, we'll see you soon. All right, thank you so much. Okay. I hope Representative uh, Kuglich can uh, hang on. I, I will. Uh, I'll hang on. Okay, good. So... Um, now, I want to welcome in, uh, along with Representative Kuglich, welcome in some of the other panelists. And you can please unmute, un, unmute your mics now. So let me go down the list and uh, say hello to our, uh, our remaining folks here. First of all, Elizabeth Kaler. She's the Wisconsin State Director for the Nature Conservancy. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks, Jeff. Great to be here. Steve Neeland. He's the Vice President of Energy System Engineering at Decentric, which is a part of the Faith Technologies uh, company. So welcome, Steve. Thank you, Jeff. Great to be here. Jane Mc McCurry, is, she's the Electrical Vehicles Program Manager at Renew Wisconsin. Welcome, Jane. Hi, thanks for having me. And John Imes, he's executive director of the Wisconsin Environmental Initiative, and uh, he was a big part in uh, in making this program happen. We were going to have uh, an event in Appleton on April 16th, but well, that didn't happen. So you're you're all here today. So welcome, welcome. So let's you know, let me just start off uh, before we get to Representative uh, Kulich and bring him in. I just want to hear from each of you, the new panelists, what the entire uh, pandemic and everything that's going on, how that is informing your view of Earth Day and Earth Day the next 50 years. Let's start with uh, Elizabeth. Well, thanks, Jeff. First, I'd like to share that the Nature Conservancy in Wisconsin is celebrating 60 years here in the state in 2020. And we have our roots in that same social soil as that Earth Day as that bipartisan movement of people who care about land and water and nature and wanna do work together to try to help this be the best planet it can be. Um, and I'm feeling so good about the ever increasing awareness of Earth Day and the positive energy around Earth Day. And that's a legacy of the many people who have protected great places for all of us to enjoy, especially now. When, we, when there are so few places where we can go and feel and be safe. And those are the same people that also created the policies that are protecting nature and protecting all of us today. So we inherit that legacy. And what's been on my mind about the COVID-19 pandemic is are the ways in which it's humbled all of us and created this shared experience around the world. We are all going through the same things and we're having to be creative and thoughtful about how we communicate differently and how we collaborate. And I'm really optimistic that these practices that we're adopting right now are just gonna make our movement stronger. Okay, thanks. Let's go to Steve Nealon from uh, Decentrics. Steve, what, what's your, how does all this inform you about Earth Day today and Earth Day down the road. So, you know, there, there, there's been a couple striking things, you know, from, from the reading I've been doing and the, the effect of the pandemic. You know, one of those, Jeff, is just the, uh, the impact that we've seen in our urban areas and just how quickly, when we stop doing business as normal and throwing some of the stuff into the environment we normally do, how quickly the environment can respond and clean itself and, and provide better air quality. And the other part of that, you know, I, th I think that's been striking is we're at a number of medical reports about how 
they feel that COVID patients may have more susceptibility due to the environment they've been living in. If they've been living in an environment with high environmental pollution, bad air pollution, let's say the LA basin, someplace like that, that they are more susceptible. And you know, I don't think that's necessarily a consideration we've had outside of maybe people that have normal breathing problems. Uh, my concern moving forward is we don't lose the momentum that we have. I mean, as, as the representative pointed out, we've seen some very good things happening uh, you know, with renewables and where those prices are going, how that's driving the market. Uh, you know, my concern is we don't lose that momentum going forward. Uh, you know, as as you know, was mentioned earlier, you know, uh, make, making sure we have the right attitude. Yeah, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. Understand that, but I am about four miles from the, uh, the coal plant here in Green Bay. That big pile of coal isn't always there either. Um, so we have to look at how can we store energy? How can we use those renewable sources and store those renewable sources, whether it's battery storage, thermal storage, it's just a different form of storage we need to be looking at to be able to take those, uh, those initiatives and keep moving those forward. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Okay, Jay McCurry from Renew Wisconsin. Again, how does, how does all this inform uh, you about uh, Earth Day now and Earth Day uh, in the future? Yeah, I would say normally I feel like Earth Day is a really great opportunity to celebrate the beautiful outdoor spaces that we have in Wisconsin and kind of reevaluate our environmental goals and personal impact. This year, I can't help see all of the interconnections between our environmental goals and our public health, equity, the economy and industry. Um, I wrote a blog post a few weeks ago about you know, the examples of clean air that Steve was talking about. LA hasn't seen smog in weeks. China uh, uh, air quality immediately improved after all of their stay at home orders. Um, and I just think it's really important to talk about the fact that it's not the economy or the environment. We have clean energy technologies that can allow us to go back to a new normal where we can have clean air that protects our public health and have really prospering um, communities and economies. And so I'm just, I can't help but see all of these interconnections between my environmental and clean energy work and all of the larger issues that we're also facing as a society today. Yeah, I mean, as a, a footnote, uh, when you read Gaylord Nelson's original speeches on Earth Day, he was taking a very broad view uh, of uh, the environment writ large. It was, it was a, um, it was about, uh, you know, living conditions, et cetera. So that's, uh, that goes to that. Okay, John Imes, I want to welcome in John Imes. He's the executive director of the Wisconsin Environmental Initiative. John, what, uh, what's your answer to my question? Well, a couple of things. I'll just mention, uh, I have a signed copy of Gaylord Nelson's 20th anniversary Earth Day speech hanging in my wall behind me. So that's- uh, This isn't a live auction, John. I know, that was not for sale. <laughs> okay. So let, let, me, let me just say, I mean, for me, Earth Day, uh, I've been doing this work for 30 years on the corporate level, on the nonprofit level, as a small business owner, and even as elected official. And I'm always feeling, um, particularly with everything that's happening now, is a sense of urgency. Um, you know, the science is, is pretty clear on this, that, you know, the next 10 years is really the defining decade for us to get a handle on, um, on addressing climate change. So I don't think we want to go from what is really a health crisis and an economic crisis, and then, and then to another systematic crisis uh, around climate change. And, you know, the, uh, the, the science is demanding that we be bold. Our young people are demanding that we be bold. So really then the challenge is how can we accelerate solutions uh, which are gonna give us a, a, a green economy um, in this state. And the Lieutenant Governor mentioned it. I mean, the young people get it. You know, they wanna work for companies that have a soul. They wanna live in a state that has a soul. And we've made a lot of progress as the representative uh, uh, mentioned. And, and, but there's, there's a lot more work to be done. And when you look at Wisconsin, um, we've got the goods to lead on this. Uh, we've got, as was mentioned, the research and development capabilities of the University of Wisconsin. We've got a great work ethic in this state. We've got good infrastructure. We have outstanding natural resources, clean air and clean water for the most part. We've got big agricultural resources. We've got uh, the number one paper and, uh, and forestry industries. And then we had this heritage 
of environmental leadership. Started as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned with the Native Americans and the, you know, the original stewards and then luminaries like Alda Leopold and John Muir and, and uh, Gaylord Nelson. And I would add even business luminaries like Sam Johnson from S.E. Johnson and, uh, and Harry Kodrachi from uh, Wisconsin. So for me, again, um, I, you know, I feel like you know, a little sense of urgency that we, there's a lot of work that we need to do. There's a lot of good things that are happening, but we really need to ramp up and we have to ramp up uh, given these other challenges in mind. I want to bring in the representative now. Do you, uh, do you sense from constituents and businesses in your, I, I know everybody's distracted by the coronavirus, how could they not be? But do you sense a, uh, that they feel a sense of urgency about, uh, about climate change and uh, uh, the environment in the next 50 years? Representative. Uh, so, I don't know if it's if it's climate change so much, but they are definitely aware of of the fact that the younger generations um, do, do want to um, support and spend their dollars at environmental conscious uh, companies and corporations. So they definitely understand that, and, and I think that that is uh, driving them to become more environmental uh, conscious. And I, I agree, I have four kids uh, between 27 and 33. I know where they're talking about. The, this, this younger generation um, is, is very uh, in tune with the environment. Thank you, Representative. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's talk a little bit about uh, transportation and, and how, yes, you know, people aren't driving as much. And so uh, yeah, air pollution in L.A. is down. I'm not sure whether that will continue. But I want to uh, ask Jane about one of the things that the representative said before about an oil glut doesn't help uh, electric vehicles. Yeah, I think that's a really fair assumption to make. Um, I, I think in general with an economy that's in decline, we're going to see a decline in all vehicle sales. So of course, news outlets are going to pick that up and say, oh, electric vehicle sales are down, which is true, but really all vehicle sales are down. Um, the really awesome thing about driving electric is that it really doesn't matter what gas prices are. It's still going to be cheaper to drive an electric vehicle because you never have to change your oil. You can refuel right in your own home. So you don't have to go out in public and touch handles and buttons that other people have been touching. Um, so, you know, even in the pandemic, I feel a lot more comfortable going down into my, my parking garage and charging my car. I, I don't have to go across the street to the gas station. Um, and so, it, you know, I think that the pandemic and lower fuel prices may take a, a short term toll on the electric vehicle market, but it's just a better technology that is cheaper over the long term. So I get derailing the market or anything like that. I think there's still a very bright future for electric transportation. Yeah, and then I want to ask Steve uh, from uh, Decentric, uh, part of Faith Technologies, in terms of the energy uh, component, you know, natural gas uh, was once, you know, was pretty trendy for a decade or so, too, with the utilities. And I'm wondering whether, do you force, and then now we're into renewables, and I'm wondering whether you see a role for natural gas or is, you know, what's the portfolio going to look like going forward? I mean, I think that's interesting. You know, you bring up natural gas, Jeff. You know, we uh, we still see natural gas, uh, especially when you look at peaking plants. You know, being a a big factor. Uh, we look at uh, a lot of private businesses that used to look at uh, diesel generators for emergency backup, uh, switching more to natural gas also. So I think there's there's that component in it. It is uh, it is a cleaner fuel from that standpoint. Uh, so I think in the near term. There's a place for that. Uh, again, in the long term, though, you know, I think you're going to see that shift to more renewables. You know, I, I applaud Jane having a uh, an electric vehicle. You know, I uh, I would uh, agree with the representative's uh, assessment that uh, in the short term, I think that uh, cheap gas prices are going to uh, affect those sales. But I think it's a blip that we're going to see. Um, and my concern moving forward from that is how are we going to continue to power all those electrical vehicles with our existing grid 
we need to incorporate more renewables as far as usage for those electric vehicles because don't want to see us continue to charge them from coal fired power plants, uh, which is what we're forced to do in, in a number of areas because that's where their energy source comes from. Uh, there are uh, there are better alternatives, even on a, a personal level. You know, it may involve putting a small solar installation in your house with them storage to be able to charge your vehicle off grid. Uh, again, to lower that environmental impact. Um, but it's something we, we need to be conscious of as we're moving forward, that we have that right infrastructure in place. And as I said, I think natural gas is, is part of that short-term plan. Long-term though, you know, as we're, we're talking about trying to shoot for that, uh, that 2050 goal, you know, to get to zero carbon and what does that mean and where do we develop those new storage technologies to do that? Uh, before I get to Elizabeth, I want to just say if you're listening in on their viewing this on the webinar uh, format, you're inside the Zoom webinar, you can ask a question, a written question uh, through uh, at the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So Elizabeth, you know, the Nature Conservancy is a, is a, is a giant real estate firm in some ways, and, and, um, and, and it's gained a reputation as being very market savvy. Now, um, I'm wondering whether... Um, you have a concern or whether uh, the roiling uh, real estate markets will affect the business you do? It's certainly something that we're paying attention to and wondering about land values and making sure that our appraisals are done in a timely fashion and certainly being fair to landowners who might be interested in working with the conservancy to protect their land. Um, so far, we have not seen a slowdown in people either reaching out to us suggesting that now might be the time that they're thinking about um, letting go of property that we would have formerly expressed an interest in because it's important for um, biodiversity or for water quality, et cetera. And our acquisition projects are moving forward. Um, it's certainly one piece, one tool in the toolbox, buying and land to protect it. And we're also working on other pieces of the puzzle that are complementary to some of the works that my colleagues have described um, certainly supporting renewable energy. One piece that the Nature Conservancy can play in that is helping folks determine, we can provide science to help determine the best siting or locations for large solar or wind fields um, to have the least impact on nature. Yeah, and I also I think maybe you should tell people how, how many holdings you have in Wisconsin. It's one of the more, uh, I, I think, uh, you've been in it here 60 years so you have a lot of holdings and maybe especially in the Baraboo Hills and they're open a lot of them are open to the public. That's true thanks we currently own and manage about 28,000 acres in Wisconsin they are those are all nature preserves that are open to the public and um, we have been a part of protecting more than 230,000 acres across the state that's about 360 square miles and I'd like to give a shout out to um, certainly Senator Nelson for founding Earth Day, but also for being part of a bipartisan effort with our former governor Knowles, creating the Knowles-Nelson State Stewardship Fund. So all those acres that we've protected in the state and many other land trusts are all, it was possible in part because of incredible public support in the state of Wisconsin for putting money, you know, investing our money into places like the Baraboo Hills, that in addition to being important for migratory birds and, and for all of us looking for some place besides home where we can get outside right now, but also those places are sequestering carbon. You know, the Lieutenant Governor mentioned that that's an important piece of the climate change picture is investing in nature because it can help solve the problem of climate change. And, and one way is our forests that capture carbon. All right, John, I haven't forgotten about you here. I want you to uh, maybe weigh in on, I think that one of your things that you like to stress is that this, uh, uh, a good environment uh, is good for business too, good for business growth. Why don't you, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, we, we always talked about, you know, doing well by doing good. And the, the, uh, the, uh, the Lieutenant Governor talked a little bit about the business role. You know, it's, um, you know, business as usual is gonna have to change. Uh, and it, it's really no longer an option. There are businesses that are making investments in technology and practice and mindset, and they're doing it for a couple of reasons. One is their customers' expectations are changing on that. Um, the other thing is I mentioned earlier, 
the young people have high expectations of, of business environmental performance. So you're gonna see, you're gonna see, I think more companies think about their climate footprint, begin to talk about science-based goals. It's just not happening uh, quick enough. Uh, I went to a White House conference. We were recognized for our leadership on climate change, 1994. And we committed to reducing uh, energy use at quad graphics by 3% a year, year after year after year. We were able to do that. And I always thought if everyone does their two, 3% and we re replace the growth with clean electrons, we'll have economic development, we'll have growth and the emissions will drop like a stone. The science is telling us it's not happening enough. And the other thing I think that the business community is facing now is the big players are getting involved. When BlackRock announced uh, earlier this year that all the considerations that they're gonna make in decision-making, remember this is, a, this is an investment entity that has $7 trillion in assets. And they basically said, we're gonna make decisions based on two issues. One is uh, sustainable development. And the second is climate change. That sent a signal to the rest of the business community, we better get our act together. Uh, and they hold, they hold a lot of, I mean, they hold 2 million shares of our local utility. They hold a lot of shares on a lot of companies I think that's gonna influence a lot of business actions. The last thing I'll say about business and how the expectations are gonna change is it's not enough for businesses to just take care of their own house. Uh, advocates, stakeholders, the public, customers are gonna also gonna to wanna to see that those, those efforts are aligned. And what I mean by that is, what is their trade association saying about climate issues? What is their gover government affairs staff are they fighting climate change initiatives? Are they fighting uh, uh, common sense policies that are gonna draw down carbon? Um, that inconsistency is gonna be called out more and more by advocates. Okay, let me go uh, up and down the panel and maybe uh, uh, this would be instructive for the representative. What, uh, do, you, do you have an item? Um, I'm gonna go to uh, Jane now, Jane of uh, Renew Wisconsin. Do you have an item that you would like to see the task force adopt? Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about the task force and the administration's commitment to climate and clean energy goals. Um, I would really love to see the task force adopt some really strong, bold transportation related goals. Uh, transportation is the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions in the country. And so I think any really strong climate action plan has to have some bold transportation goals. Um, and so my recommendation would be to look at electric vehicle adoption, look at public transportation, and also look at ways that you can really be incentivizing active transportation so people can walk and bike um, when that's available to them. Okay, thank you, Steve. Steve from Faith Technologies, Decentric. What, uh, would you like to see the task force adopt a certain item? So I, uh... I'm involved with a, a working group with the Midwest Energy Research Consortium, uh, involved around, you know, how do we look at, at regulation moving forward? Uh, you know, we have some, some states around us that are much more friendly when it comes to renewables and integration of renewables. Uh, but I don't think it's a, it's a legislative solution. I think it's a solution that, uh, that people behind the meter, consumers, and utilities need to work out that solution together because it has to be equitable across the board. Uh, you know, I, I think there's there's maybe at times too much, you know, digging in on each side, and, and that's one thing I find uh, encouraging about that working group, and and maybe taking uh, taking some of the input from that working group on what we're doing because we're meeting with uh, with a group that includes utilities, academia, includes uh, people from the state energy office, from private business, from consumer groups. And trying to come up with solutions that, that work for everyone. Because again, we need it to be fair and equitable, not just for the consumer, but for the utility also. Uh, and quite often, I think that gets lost in the conversation. We need to make sure it's a, it's a balanced approach. So that's one thing I would look from the task force is, is how do we do that? And how do we maybe, uh, maybe adopt rules and policies that are co-developed together by those groups that are more friendly to those initiatives that we're looking at moving forward? Okay, Elizabeth from the Nature Conservancy. Anything on the on your front that you would like to see the task force take up? Well, the Conservancy is certainly very supportive of comprehensive emissions reductions and working with Wisconsinites to um, build a better dialogue about climate change so we can really support those policies and move them forward. 
But I think perhaps what's unique to our field and to conservation is um, we would really love the task force to be including in those policies opportunities to invest in nature to help solve um, some of these problems from climate change, certainly to mitigate and lessen climate, lessen climate change. But then also things like recognizing that if we invest in wetlands, they can help reduce and lessen the floods that are coming that we're seeing as part of the big storm events that climate change brings. And there are a range of other ways that nature can help solve our problems. And we would really welcome the task force to consider those. Yeah, uh, John, uh, uh, do you have any uh, recommendations for the representative and the Lieutenant Governor on what uh, should be you know, an item that you really want in there? Yeah, sure. Uh, let, let's find ways to accelerate the, the clean economy. Uh, Lieutenant Governor mentioned the, the job potential you know, our state, we, the last decade, we really kind of turned our back on investment in renewable energy and on, on uh, clean energy jobs and, and policies. You know, before the pandemic hit, the, the, not, the top two entry level of jobs in the country were wind technicians and solar system installers. Uh, these kids are coming out of certificate programs, they're coming out of associate degree programs, they're getting family supporting jobs with great benefits. I think we want to find a way to, to ramp, we want to ramp that up. You know, 25% of these jobs are held by women. 25% of these jobs are held by people of color. This is an economic development opportunity while we address climate. And the other thing I would add is more internal, I think, to government operations is to think about our procurement. Uh, state and local government, we, we buy a lot of stuff. We contract with a lot of providers. And if we raise the bar in terms of expectations on companies in that supply chain, that we expect an environmental management system, that we expect that you know, these are issues that they're taking into account as they provide products and services for the state. I think that could, that could generate a lot of, a lot of good uh, results. Yeah, we didn't mention agriculture. I know I don't have an agriculture expert here, but certainly uh, um, agriculture practices and uh, food production uh, have an impact on climate. Uh, don't they? Do you think that would be one of your charges, Representative Kuglich? Well, before I answer that, I just wanted to let John know is that I actually authored the bill and passed it in the assembly, and it probably would have been passed in the Senate if we didn't have the pandemic on um, on the jobs bill, which would utilize the fast forward program at DWD. That's right. Uh, to give grants for training. Yep. Um, for wind, inst uh, wind installers and, or solar installers and uh, wind technicians. So I agree with you on that one. And, uh, and hopefully when the pandemic's over, we can get uh, back to passing that. Um, and then your question, um, I'm sorry. Well, uh, do you think uh, agriculture and food production will be part of the, uh, uh, the task force's charge? You know, I, I don't, we haven't, touch that at this point. Um, and, and again, as the Lieutenant Governor said, we are kind of um, have been condensed because of pandemic. But, um, you know, one of the things is that what we need to achieve from the, the, the task force, and, and this might just even get it more vast, is we need to kind of bring it down the funnel and get to three or four things that we can really concentrate and I think that um, lastly, I want to say is that as far as you had a question about a tangible outcome from yeah. the task force, and I just want to touch on that because I think the conversation and the awareness of us getting together and having this conversation is the first step. Uh, we're not far enough down the line in the process to get specific recommendations, but I heard a couple people talk about this and I don't, th I think we need to change the conversation to carbon free or reduction in carbon instead of pinpointing uh, renewables or solar or wind. Because I think we have to just, everything we do has to be either, does it reduce carbon or not? And I think that is, if we can get ourselves around that, I think it's gonna help us kind of get through that funnel and get down to um, a tangible outcome that, that will have a benefit. 
Okay, well, we're uh, about out of time. And so uh, I want to thank everybody uh, who took uh, part, uh, uh, played a part in this today. I think it was very meaningful. And, uh, you know, I look forward uh, to uh, hearing more from you in the future. Maybe we'll be able to convene in person someday. But thank you, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. Thank you, uh, State Representative Mike Kublich. Uh, thank you, Steve Neeland from uh, Faith Technologies. Thank you, John Hines from the Wisconsin Environmental Initiative. Thank you, Elizabeth Kaler from the Nature, Conservi Nature Conservancy. Thank you, Jane McCurry from Renew Wisconsin. And I want to thank all our sponsors. If I had that sponsor slide, here it is. I'll be able to remember them all. All right, Hush Blackwell, American Family Insurance, Walmart, XL Energy, ARP Wisconsin, Wisconsin Hospital Association, Bolt Construction Company, the Outrider Foundation, and the Wisconsin Environmental Initiative. So again, thank you, everybody. Thank you for being part of Earth Day the next 50 years, and we'll do more of these in the future. So see you later, everybody.